you know, the responsibility of living is really interesting. A lot of people want to get away from everybody, move to the middle of the desert in a trailer. But there's a responsibility. If you're born in this life, it's very good that we need to think this through. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program taking you through the Bible. Today, we're in Thessalonians. This is really good. Second Thessalonians, actually. Corey, what's up? I'm looking at a controversial location, Bethany Beyond the Jordan. Excellent. Look forward to that. What did you do, Janice? We are going to talk about prayer. All right, prayer. There you go. Prayer is very important. And Ryan is here to tell us what he's doing, Ryan. Today, I'm talking about a scroll that's given to the son of David, but I'm not referring to King Solomon. All right, that's another interesting one. We'll look forward to that, Ryan. So get your Bible guide. Turn to today's passage as we go through the Bible, and Christmas is coming up very soon. So this is a good day to study. going to be taking a look at this debate over the location of Bethany beyond the Jordan. Now there are a few Bethanies that are mentioned, two Bethanies that are mentioned in the New Testament Gospels. Uh, this one of course being distinguished by being beyond the Jordan River. But beyond from which direction? Well, you and I are going to take a look at it right now. The Gospel of John identifies the place where John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan River. It says all this happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Locating this Bethany beyond or across the Jordan has proved troubling. The debate is essentially split between those who believe it is on the western side of the Jordan River in modern day Israel and those that hold to it meaning east of the Jordan River in modern day Jordan. A simple way of solving this should come from the Gospels. Noteworthy passages would be John 1.28 and John 10.40. In each case, across the Jordan points to an eastern location. Jesus traveled from Galilee west of the Jordan River and then went across the river to arrive on the eastern shore. He also left Jerusalem west of the river and crossed the Jordan River to arrive at the place of John's baptism. The trouble over this seems to have begun in the third century AD with highly respected church father Origen. Origen was unaware of a place called Bethany by the Jordan, so he proposed that the scriptures actually meant a place named Beth Arba located on the west of the Jordan. Though Origen based his conclusion on his own limited knowledge, his reputation gave weight to the conclusion. It was even put in some of the manuscript copies of the Gospels as a place name update. So where is this Bethany beyond the Jordan? West or east? The discussion continues, but ongoing excavations at a site east of the Jordan clearly show a place many Byzantine Christians believe to be Bethany. The site is now named Baptism Archaeological Park because an entire Byzantine monastery complex has been unearthed that incorporates water features, baptismal pools, natural springs, a cave, reservoirs, and water channels. The ruins of several churches have also been found here, one built up on arches to allow the flood waters of the Jordan to pass right underneath the sanctuary. The problem of Bethany beyond the Jordan is not an easy one, but it seems that the evidence is stacked on the eastern bank. So this represents one of the challenges, but also one of the fun aspects, I think, of biblical archaeology, where you have to try an attempt to locate a city or a place whose location has been lost to time. So this is where archaeology really helps, even just archaeological surveys, where archaeologists go out and they walk the land and they record what they find. Uh, you know, this is how they decide where they want to dig and things like that. But especially in a land with, uh, like Israel that has such a rich history, so much development, uh, and so much human history there, uh, they often find very interesting things even exposed on the surface of the land today. So Bethany Beyond the Jordan is just one example of just this 
fun puzzle that scholars and archaeologists feel obligated to track down. You know, when the Bible is describing a location, especially in the New Testament Gospels, the authors are very meticulous in uh, recording some of the geography of the area uh, because it has to do with, with what actually happened, with the, with the traveling that was going on and the teaching that was going on. Uh, so archaeologists are in this really interesting place where they have to track this puzzle down. They have to ask those questions. And it becomes this really interesting mix of looking at the words that are recorded in the Bible, looking at cultural history, and then also looking at artifacts and buildings that they can find through actual archaeological digs. From Corinth, this second letter from Paul to the church in Thessalonica is interesting. Paul was in Corinth on his second missionary journey, and he needed to clarify some things that he wrote in the first book. The people in the church took a surprising turn. The dominant theme of this book is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Paul wants to make it clear and explains to the people that he's not confused about what will happen. He speaks of events that will take place, and the return of Christ is coming very soon. Interestingly, Paul ends the book in chapter 3 with a request to the believers to pray for him and those who are doing the work of the Lord around him. Paul did not see faith in Jesus Christ as some might view a cult today, because asking for prayer from fellow believers is something very different. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. You know, this is amazing. As we continue to read through the passages, I'm looking at 2 Thessalonians, and uh, at the end of the chapter, you know, it, it really is interesting because he says, now may the Lord uh, of peace, the Lord of peace. I think that's interesting today. We have terrorism everywhere. We have government doing this. We have anti-government doing that. Everybody's up and upset with everybody. Everybody's the Lord of peace. He says, now may the Lord of peace himself, may the Lord of peace give you peace at all times in every way. All times in every way. Yes, every way. He, he says this, it says, the Lord be with you all. That is chapter three of 2 Thessalonians. That's the end of it. And let me tell you something. That's exactly what Paul said. Paul said, I, I want the Lord of peace to come to you. Now, we talked about this on the last Quick Study television program. I'm going to talk more about it today. But first, get your Bible guide. Now, I got to tell you something. I am so excited about the Bible guide for next year. It looks really good. 
I mean, Corey's written her stuff and Ryan's written his stuff and Janice. And I mean to tell you, it is the first time that we've done a full Bible guide. And I'm really something excited about this. Now, they won't let me show you, but I want to tell you, it's really good. It's a different size than the Bible guides have been in the past. I want to say that I think I would get it. It's got a lot of things in it, beloved, and you need to read it. So I would sign up, use the addresses on the bottom of the screen, uh, or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com. And when you go there, go to uh, donate, make a donation in any amount, or you can call us at the addresses on the bottom of the screen. Get in contact with us and, and say, I want to sign up for the Bible guide for next year. And that'll be great because uh, I'll tell you, it's going to be very exciting as we go through the Bible again from Genesis. Very interesting. All right. Get the world's best-selling book out, the world's best book. It's the Bible. Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the responsibility of living. A lot of people say, I just want to live my life. Let me be. I just want to live, man. Just let me live. But there's responsibility in living. You see, everything has responsibility. I don't want responsibility. I just want to live my own life in a trailer out in the middle of the desert. Well, even there's responsibility to living. So we, have to, we have to understand that, beloved. And so we're going to read 2 Thessalonians 1 to 3 today, and we're going to look at 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 to 9. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, you would take this word and put it in our heart. Help us to see what you're saying. Help us to understand what you're telling us today, because it's exciting. And what you're going to say is something incredible. Work. I pray the Holy Spirit would work our hearts to hear you. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen. Now, listen carefully to what the Holy Spirit says. It says in 2 Thessalonians 3, Finally, brethren, pray for us, Paul says. He says, pray for us. Very important. That's a difference between cults and faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Pray the word gets out there and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith. Not everybody has faith. See, here's the point that Paul knows. If we love the Lord, the most important thing we must do is pray. And a lot of people are praying. They say, I pray for this and I pray, but is your heart, is your spirit, is your soul aligned with Jesus Christ? Are you aligned with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God in three expressions? Are you aligned with him? Now, if you're not, and that's what reading the word is, Paul said, pray that the word gets out there so that people can align their hearts with God and they can move in this world. That's exactly what the Bible says. That's what we just did. And we need to do that. We need to pray, Father, help us to hear your word today in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, it gets better. Watch this. But the Lord is faithful. God is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. All right, so there's God and there's this evil one. That's Satan. And we have confidence in the Lord. Our confidence is in God concerning you, both that you do and will do the things that we commanded you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience, oh, I love that, patience of Christ. Oh, my goodness. Now, when we pray, we must trust the Lord. I remember a uh, recent prayer meeting. I was praying for somebody. We have a prayer meeting weekly, and uh, we take all your prayer requests, and we lay them down in the office table, and we pray over them. And this one guy said, I pray for patience. And I thought, oh, my goodness, Lord Jesus, give him the patience of Jesus Christ. Because that's really a, that's a tough one. And he was honest about it. Praise God. And I believe that the Lord will help him because God gives us things that we, we ourselves can't handle, but the Holy Spirit in us teaches us how to handle those. Very important. Now, let's look at the last passage of scripture here. It says in verse six, but we command you brethren in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the name. That name's important. The name of Jesus Christ. 
We command you, brethren, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother to get away from him who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. People who walk away and they don't, you know, walk away from doctrine, he says, stay away from them. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. But we worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. This is what he said. Paul said this. We are commanded to withdraw from people who use and abuse God's kingdom. Now, I need to tell you, it's important for us to have pastors. It's important for us to have people in the church. But when those people begin to look at the church and the calling as a career, it's wrong. It's not a career. It's a calling. See, we, we don't, you know, we don't go to church and fulfill somebody's job description by giving them this, this. Hold on a minute. It's a calling, beloved. I know I... I really think we need to understand what the church is. And when we give our pastor resources and money, he deserves it. And we don't just hold back on him, but it's a calling, beloved. It's not a career. And we really need to understand that. So, Father, help us today to learn what it is, as Paul said, as examples. Help us to withdraw from people who do not teach correctly what it is to follow you and fulfill your calling. If you want to find out something about somebody, you look at their letters, the personal letters of Paul. Now, this is really good because we're moving into 1 Timothy. And 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus are personal letters. Paul wrote, we learn a lot about what he thought and how he thought about God and where the Holy Spirit is in all of this. We'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Make time to join us. It'll be good. Ryan? Today I'm talking about a scroll that's given to the son of David, but I'm not referring to Solomon, but to another son of David. In fact, he is the son of David, Jesus Christ. See, in Revelation chapter 6, Jesus begins to break a seven-sealed scroll that was given to him by God in Revelation chapter 5. With each new breaking of a seal comes destructions, the first four famously represented by the four horsemen. But have you ever wondered about what the scroll is itself? What is this document sealed with seven seals? Revelation chapter 6 through 16 chronicles the breaking of the seven seals on the scroll which God the Father gave to Jesus Christ in chapter 5. The first four seals are commonly known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That is the white horse of the Antichrist, the red horse of war, the black horse of famine, and the pale horse of death and hell. The fifth seal is martyred believers in heaven during the tribulation who cry out to God for vindication. And the breaking of the sixth seal brings six cosmic disturbances. A great earthquake, the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair, the moon becoming like blood, the falling of the stars, the sky splitting apart like a scroll, 
and the mountains and islands moving out of place. With the breaking of the seventh and final seal brings the seven trumpet judgments. While Revelation holds many great mysteries, one that should not be overlooked is the seven sealed scroll. What is this document and why is it sealed with seven seals? According to pastor and end times author, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, the only document in that day that was sealed with seven seals was a will. So the seven sealed scroll in Revelation 6 is the Father's will to the Son. What is the Son's inheritance? It is the kingdom, of course. When all the seals are broken and the scroll is completely enrolled, Jesus Christ receives his inheritance in full. Revelation 20 explains that Satan will be bound during Jesus Christ's 1,000 year reign on the earth. At the end of those 1,000 years, Satan will then be released once more to deceive the world before finally being cast into the lake of fire and brimstone to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, will then make all things new and create a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus Christ, therefore, the only begotten Son of God, will receive the will from his Father and inherit the kingdom to rule forever and ever. So the seven sealed scroll is God the Father's will to his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus alone has the right to rule Israel and the entire world and universe, and he will. Also interesting is that due to the burning of the Jewish temple in AD 70 by the Romans, the records of the kingly line were lost. The only records that now exist are the genealogies of Jesus Christ in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, which legally prove that he is a son of King David, and therefore the only heir to the throne. Therefore, the future government we have to look forward to is a theocracy, a God-run government. And I'm very much looking forward to that day. But Ryan, a lot of people aren't. A lot of people mm. feel that, you know, God has, uh, God is setting up a democracy, you know, a republic democracy like we have now. But that's not true. No, it's not. I mean, we, we don't have peace on earth, do we? We don't no. have, it's, I mean, we, we're, we live in a time of complete political unrest. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's not going to be with Jesus Christ. It says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. I mean, he is going mm -hmm. to be the ruler of the entire world. Yeah, and we, we have social unrest. We have economic unrest. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to recognize that we can't do it all. Yeah. Uh, that's hard. Yeah, and I, and I think, too, like, to be fair, we don't know what a proper theocracy looks like. We have nothing to compare that to. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, some people try to try to look back at, you know, the time period of Moses or the time period of David, but it doesn't work because Moses and David were men. They were humans just like us, and they, and they have issues, and we see those issues play out in Scripture. So you have nothing to compare this to. Except the brief time in the garden. <laughs> very brief. No, very, That's very not brief. Describe <laughs> yeah. properly no, it's true. at all. But that would be the closest thing. The closest yeah. thing. But, I mean, we, we, we can trust in the character of God, and we know that he created us with brains and with, and with reason for reason. So, I mean, but yeah, the we don't have to be scared of the fact that this is going to be a theocracy and we're not going to be able to vote. I, I, I think that no, when the point is we're not going to want to vote. That's, I think right. That, that's right. And I think that, I mean, when you look at the brief time in the garden, before sin, God would come down and he would walk with man mm -hmm. and they would right. talk together. Yeah. I mean, that, interesting. that's wonderful. Shockingly it's interesting. Yeah. amazing. <laughs> I mean, truly it is. Yeah. And uh, that's all we have mm -hmm. to, to look at. So that's we'll really see. interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> tell us what you have, what we're giving away. Right, our offers for this month, it was for November, now it's for December as well, are our uh, DVD sets. So this first one that I have here, uh, there are two DVDs in here. It's Pastor Rod's Unlocking the Bible. And what this is, it's, a, it's a, kind of like an introductory course in how to read, study, and interpret the scriptures. So if you are interested in that, then take a look at this. Uh, you know, get a hold of us, get a hold of it. It's Pastor Rod's Unlocking the Bible, and it's for a suggested donation of $40 to help keep the ministry strong. Uh, that's what your donations really do. They help keep us going and, and they fuel the mission of Quick Study. So our second DVD set is our Discover the World of the Bible set. Now there are three DVDs in here, three episodes. This is all about biblical history and archaeology. Uh, there is an episode, a DVD in here, about the time period of the kings of Israel. There's one about uh, the time period in between the Old and New Testaments. What, what happened 
happened in there. Uh, and then there's one about the beginning of the time period of the Gospels. We'll also send along with this our Old and New Testament timelines as well, which is biblical information on it on um, a timeline uh, for you. So if you would like to get a hold of this, there's also bonus features, which are segments from the Quick Study Show. Uh, it, it's for a suggested donation of $60 to the ministry. Use the addresses on the program. Tell us what you did. Well, you know, I'm looking forward to someday meeting the Apostle Paul. He is writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he says, pray for us, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. And listen to what he says, but... The Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And listen to this. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. And he ends it. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Paul understood the power of prayer. And that is something that you will hear us talking about many times. And if you are one of our partners, somebody who partners with us, you will receive in the mail an envelope that has a place for you to write your prayer requests or a place that you can go on to on our website where you can email us your prayer requests because we too believe in the power of prayer. We believe, as Paul says here, and we have confidence in the Lord. It's in the Lord concerning you. You know, it's not our prayers that, that, that bring the power. It's that participation that God is faithful and God's will will be done in, in our lives and in yours as well. And that's such a, that is something that we need to remember as believers, I think that if I was the enemy and I wanted you not to know about a power, I would try to sway you away from things. And two things I see the enemy doing, and in this short amount of time, I'm going to say, he's removing the authority of the Bible in our world today, especially in our Western culture. We've seen it slide, 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 slide. And he's trying to take away our knowledge of the power that we have through Jesus Christ, through God the Father, in our prayers in Jesus' name. So when you write to us, when you call in your prayer requests, when we pray together and we agree and we thank you for your prayers for us, we have confidence in the Lord that he hears us and he will answer our prayers. So don't give up. Prayer is, is powerful and the word of God is to get that word of God in here, not just up here, but let it come into your heart so that when you pray, God hears you and he will answer. He is our confidence.